Are you ready? Yes, yes, we can I'm start. Ready. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, once again, good evening and welcome to another session of KTM Muscat Runners. Today, we have somebody very special from our own home. Uh, you have heard people from Dubai, you have heard people from India. Now we have our own family doctor with us today. Uh, he is the, uh, for, for those who do not know Dr. Vishwajit, he is uh, the orthopedic surgeon working with the Kim's Hospital, Muscat. And he is considered to be the family doctor of uh, most of the runners. And that has got advantage and disadvantage for me. Because when oh, I uh, tell my runners now, don't increase your pace, don't run every day, go for alternative days. Now they say that, uh, Dr. Hena, what is the problem? <laughs> so our runners have got so much confidence in him and today he will be addressing us. Now I am giving the podium to doctor. Let us welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you RK for that very kind introduction and uh, good to be here among all of you. Um, uh, very nice to give me the opportunity for uh, talking on this uh, topic. Uh, so shall we get started with the topic? I, I want to do a screen share. Is that possible? Yes, yes, you can, you can do it. Okay, okay, let me try. I, I have a small presentation and as I run through the presentation, I'll give the talk, okay? Just give me a minute. The full screen is actually hiding my presentation, so I'm getting it down to another screen and then I think we should be able to go. So there is one share screen option which you can upload. You are, you are able to do it, no? Yeah, uh, it just for some reason it was not showing the other one. Okay, yeah, I think we are ready. Uh, just put it in presentation. Too many, too many my fault, too many uh, windows open on my... Uh, laptop. So <laughs> I'm getting confused. Okay. Uh, you're able to see now? Uh, it is still not visible. It's coming. It's loading. loading. Yeah. yeah. Something is coming. I'll just wait for a while, for a few seconds. It has come now. Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, thank you again uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all for about healthy running. 
Uh, I know, <laughs> I know all of you are uh, good runners and uh, good at it. And uh, but I'll try to speak a little bit about uh, some running injuries. Uh, that's what I'll concentrate on. As you all know, I'm 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 very much an amateur, like uh, many of you in the group. I'm not I'm not a very experienced runner, but I've done a few runs, and from that I have gained some experience and knowledge about uh, what kind of injuries to expect. So before we get started, uh, uh, happy festival to all of you. Today was uh, wish you, I think, and happy wish you to all of you. And um, you all know that um, it, it, it's, the topic is actually the other way around. We all know for an established fact that running is healthy. It is a healthy uh, activity. Uh, the, it doesn't require much to talk on that. Uh, it's been shown to improve our cardiovascular status. It is a great stress relief, helps us to achieve and maintain discipline and is a very cost effective way of uh, being doing an exercise. All that you need is a good pair of shoes and nothing else and it helps us keep motivated. So, um, but still then uh, the most common question I get when I uh, tell my uh, patients who come to see me that one of the things that you can do to get into exercise is running. It's a very simple exercise. Uh, put on a pair of shoes and start walking. And the most common question they ask is, uh, doctor, will I get arthritis from this? Am I not going to injure my knee? Am I going to be repetitively, you know, impacting my knee and cause arthritis? So there was a big study done uh, recently and reported in one of the uh, journals. They interviewed thousands of uh, 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 runners and non-runners, and they looked at the incidence of arthritis in these uh, people. And they found that competitive running almost 13, uh, 13 to 14 percent of these had arthritis in them if you are doing competitive running and uh, the uh, and and the non-runner the person who does not run at all or doesn't do any activity had an incidence of around 10 percent but the most surprising thing was recreational running the running that we all do uh, uh, as a recreational sport uh, the incidence of arthritis was 3.5 percent only uh, so the surprising thing was that not only there is no risk of having arthritis, but there was some kind of protective effect from running uh, in, in the recreational runner. So all the more reason that you should be running uh, as a recreational activity and you are certain, certain, certain not to have arthritis like the way if you don't do running. Okay, so this is, this is a mental block that most people have and that arthritis is not, uh, cannot be a reason uh, not to run. Okay. But in, in case you have arthritis, which a lot of patients do have, in case you have arthritis, obviously running may not be the kind of activity that you should do. I tell most of the patients who have arthritis already, who have been diagnosed to have arthritis, to do some kind of non-impact exercise, you know, exercise that does not impact the knee. So non-impact exercises are like cycling, swimming, yoga, or even uh, cycle, uh, uh, dancing, mild dancing can also be done. So these are the uh, non-impact exercises. The most uh, common thing uh, pattern we see uh, when a runner starts is what we call as the foot strike pattern. Um, I was uh, I had uh, joined the um, discussion group discussion you had the other day with the runners from uh, Souls of Cochin. Is that right? Yes. Uh, from Cochin, I think yes. So we had this uh, Apu was uh, the orthopedic surgeon was trying to explain with a diagram you know about the type of uh, pattern of running. So if you look at the type of, uh, the way the foot strikes the ground, you can divide runners into these three groups, A, B, and C. Basically the foot can be divided into three sections. You have the front portion, which we call as the forefoot, then the middle portion, the midfoot, and the uh, portion which is in the back or the heel portion, which we call as the hind foot. So normally when people start running, they fall into either of these three categories, depending upon how the foot lands on the ground. So A, you have him landing on the forefoot, B, landing on the midfoot, and C, and the hind foot. What it has been seen is that most people who start running, start with the type C running, where they land on the hind foot. And this is usually because most people start running with a good pair of shoes, and most shoes shoe companies usually advertise on uh, or usually focus on how good the heel is. So they end up running on the heels. They land on the heels 
and uh, that can be a problem actually. So I'll, I'll show you this small video. Let me know if you can see the video running. Hopefully it plays. So basically what happens is that when you land on your heel, there is a little change in the way you run. So this was, uh, this, uh, this, was uh, this particular runner in this video is being videographed uh, before being instructed and after being instructed. That is how to run properly, okay? So this is the first one. Are you able to see the video running? No, no sir, uh, we are not able to okay. see. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I think it's taking a little time, uh, but... Uh, now it it is playing but i think it is on jinx maybe okay 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 it's, it's showing it. now yes yes yeah. Yeah. yeah probably there's a little lag i think that's okay uh, so what i'll do is i will i will stop it in that particular point and then we can i'll i'll discuss about uh, so in the first instance if you see um, if you are able to see uh, the the person the is I think it went out. Okay, so uh, what happens is that when you land on your heels, um, the knee will remain straight, like a straight line, okay? And so what happens is the entire impact falls, uh, runs through the heel, knee, right up till the hip. So the load or the force, impact force, when you land on the ground, goes right through the knee. So that leads to one of the common uh, uh, problems of knee pain. So the better way is, is actually to land on the forefoot or the midfoot. So if you land on the forefoot or the midfoot, what happens is that the knee stays bent a little bit. If the knee stays bent, it behaves like a spring. So it will absorb and it will release the energy. So the energy will actually not pass through the knee. So there won't be much of an impact on the knee. So therefore, actually um, experienced uh, runners if you see them they will be always running landing on the forefoot or the midfoot in fact very fast runners will run on the uh, forefoot because they want to push the ground very quickly and uh, long distance runners will usually land on the midfoot so that would be the right way to do the running i think there is a lag so we will skip that bit um, so uh, i will maybe at the end of the uh, end of the presentation i'll run the video if it uh, if i'm able to but uh, so that is the uh, that is the issue so so if you have to land when you are doing this running you should be landing on the ball of the feet if you can see that uh, diagram of the feet that uh, marked area is the ball of the feet this is where the ball of the feet that is the forefoot and the midfoot if you land on that area then your knee will be behaving like a spring then you will not be having knee pain. This is one of the common uh, issues that uh, beginners have is that they come with knee pain and this is the reason why they have knee pain. Uh, maybe we'll continue and I'll come back to this slide a little later. So the same, this, this, this video was showing the uh, part of the body from the waist downwards, that is the hip, knee and the ankle. But if you look at the upper body, uh, this is a picture of an Ironman uh, champion. And if you see, you can draw a straight line through the body. His body, upper body is completely erect and absolutely over the knee and the ankle. So that happens because he has a very good core body. This was another point that Apu was making the other day, that having a good core body is important. Otherwise, what happens is you start slouching, your, you start bending at the hip and your body, uh, the center of uh, uh, force of the body starts to fall forwards. Then you are uh, running the wrong way. So having doing good core body and keeping the body erect over the uh, running is a good running form to have. So if you look at the injuries that uh, the runners face, you can divide them into two major groups. One is the trauma related injury and the other one is what we call as the overuse injury. Trauma related injury means that the person had a fall or a bad twist in the ankle or the knee, and something major has got injured, like either there is a fracture, break in the bone, or there is a tear in a ligament, or tear in a cartilage, or tear in a tendon. Those, so that, 
that kind of traumatic injuries are also seen, but uh, that is a little rare in runners and certainly not in beginners, more seen in competitive sport because there the running is of a different type. There they are trying to uh, reach or complete a run in a particular uh, time frame, you know, so they are running fast, they are running speedily. So that is a different uh, ball game together and uh, traumatic injuries in runners is a little uncommon, especially if you're doing recreational running. Sometime you may be having, so that's a different ball game. I won't talk too much about that. It's very obvious when you have a traumatic injury that you have a broken bone or you have a really torn ligament, then you're really hobbling around in pain. And certainly, you know, you'll have to uh, visit a doctor or a hospital or a clinic and get the appropriate treatment for that. So that's a little different. So I won't talk too much about that. The other one is the overuse injury. The overuse injury is a very subtle form of injury and it is necessary to identify that so that the injury severity does not increase, okay? So I will talk a little bit more on in, 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 uh, in detail about that. But for traumatic injury, you know, how, how do I avoid traumatic injury? If I, if, now that I know that there is a type of injury called traumatic injury, how do I avoid it? Basically, you have to, uh, this kind of injury is best prevented. Any kind of injury, whether traumatic or overuse, is best prevented. But traumatic injury, there's nothing much to do for you after you've had the injury. You have to go to the hospital and take care. But how do you prevent it? Best is, you know, these are, these are the regular things. If you're doing running on the road, then you have to wear really high visibility clothes, clothes that are bright, brightly colored, that are reflective, so that people on the road can see you and visualize you. This is very important, especially if you're running in low light conditions like uh, late evenings or early mornings, this is very important. Also important is you must run against the flow of the traffic, which means that, for example, if you're uh, in Muscat, we know vehicles are on the right hand. So you must be running on the left hand, uh, left hand side of the road. If you're running on the left hand side of the road, you can see an approaching vehicle, a vehicle that's approaching you and you can get out of the way. But if you are running on the right hand side and a vehicle is coming from behind, there's no way you can see. Then everything depends upon the vehicle driver. So it's better always to run on the opposite side of the road. So the same rule applies in India. For example, in India, you have left, left side drive. So you should be running on the right side of the road. This is very important. Also, it's better to carry an ID with you because in case you get injured or, and people need to identify you, then they can, uh, with the ID, they can identify and inform people who are, you know, your friends or your family so that they know that you're injured. And it's always important to obey traffic rules. You may not be driving the road, uh, a vehicle on the road, but it's important to cross the road on the zebra crossing. Don't cross in the middle of the road. It's, it's dangerous. Believe me, uh, having an accident is not a good idea. We get patients like that, people who are uh, crossing the road and they get hit by vehicles and they are really bad injuries and we have to treat those injuries. So don't do that. Always use the zebra crossing for crossing roads. If possible, take side roads, use side roads. Don't run on the main road. If you have access to side roads, use the side roads because traffic is always less. And if you're using headphones or earbuds, try to keep the volume low or in fact, try to avoid them if you're doing road running. They are better used when you're running on trails or when you're running in the parks or when you're running in non-traffic conditions. And if you're using them, keep the volume low. And the best thing is run in a group. If you're running in a group, you have friends with you, friends who will take care of you, make sure you don't do these things. So that's why uh, be in a group, be with friends, be with people, and then you will not have issues like this, okay? But in case you do get injured, what should you do? So there are, we have this common acronym that we use. We call it RICE. RICE, R-I-C-E, R meaning rest. You have to rest the part. I sit, apply eyes. Usually you should not apply eyes directly on the skin because just like extreme heat can burn the skin, extreme cold can also burn the skin. It can make it more painful. So the best way to apply eyes is to put it in a Ziploc bag cover it in a towel and apply it on the injured part. For example, you've twisted your ankle, then apply ice, give compression. So use a crepe bandage, which you can, the red color bandage, uh, it's usually white here. You can use a compressive bandage so that you reduce the swelling. It gives comfort, some stability to that particular joint and elevate it. Elevate it means, for example, if it's ankle injury, the ankle must be above the knee so that the blood can flow back. This will help reduce swelling and discomfort in that particular area. So if you have an injury, do rice. 
Some people add a P to it and call it price. That is, you use a protective material around it. For example, if it's a knee, you use a knee cap or a knee brace, ankle, similarly ankle wraps, ankle uh, splints, that kind of thing, okay? So the other kind of injury, which I was talking about, the non-traumatic or the overuse injury, this is a more common injury and it's a more subtle way of happening. You know, running like any other sport, like running, cycling, all these are repetitive activities where you are repetitively doing something. And overuse injury is a repetitive kind of injury where in traumatic injury, you have a big force which breaks the bone or the structural integrity of the bone is lost or the ligament or the muscle is torn. Here, the force is not that strong. It is a lesser, less intense force. But because it is happening repeatedly again and again and again, uh, there is a chance that the particular bone or the muscle or the tendon or the ligament may give away and result in injury. You know, uh, we take about, like the uh, slide is saying, 1,000 to 1,500 steps per mile. And every time we land on the body, we are giving almost 2.5 to 3 times our body weight which means if you are a 70 kg person, you're almost giving around 200 kgs of load on the, uh, on, the, on the joints and the bones whenever you're doing a running exercise. And this you're doing 1,000, 1,500 times uh, only for a mile of running. So therefore, you're prone to have injuries if you do not take care. So this overuse injury has two components to it. One, there is some technical problem. There is some imbalance issue or tightness issue. Plus, there is an increased volume and intensity of training. So that's why uh, uh, it's put as too much, too soon, and too fast. That means either you're running very fast or you're doing a lot of training or you're doing it too quickly. That means all your training must improve or increase gradually and not too quickly. That's what leads to overuse injury. So you have both these issues happening. You have a technical issue. That means if you have a technical issue and you're not doing you know, too much of running, it may stay subclinical. It may not become apparent un un until and unless you start doing a lot of running or uh, cycling activity. That's when the overuse injury becomes uh, very apparent. So, the, so like I said, it's an imbalance. Always in medicine, it's an imbalance issue, especially in uh, orthopedic or musculoskeletal issues, uh, uh, injuries involving muscles, bones, tendons, and ligaments, it's an imbalance issue. So here in this particular issue, your training load is increasing, probably either it volume-wise, that means you're doing a lot of running, or intensity-wise, that means you're running very fast or running too much of uphills, or you're doing you know, uh, um, more frequent runnings uh, instead of spacing it out. So your tissues or your, these tissues, meaning this bone, the skeleton, the muscle, the tendons and the ligaments, they have a capacity. So they, they will bear the load until that particular capacity. Beyond that capacity, they will break down. That means injury will happen. So, so, so you have to do two things here. Here, your training must progress gradually. And at the same time, the tissue strength and flexibility must also improve gradually. So that happens gradually and therefore your training must also go uh, gradually. So therefore, just like everything else in life, you know, most things in life, moderation is the key. No too much sugar, no too much fat. Same way, training is also should not be too much, too quick. It should be slow and gradual. And that's very important. This, this is a problem, especially when you're running in groups because sometimes you see uh, people in different levels of activity. You know, some people will be running slow, some people will be running moderately fast and some people will be running fast. And sometimes you may think, why am I not running fast like that guy? Let me try to catch up with them. That's when injury happens. That's why categorizing people into different groups is an important way of uh, dealing with that issue, is to run with your group and slowly, gradually increase your pace. And then you'll be um, in the front uh, leading with the other runners as well. Okay. So one of the questions uh, Ake had forwarded was, what are the signs? How do I know this overrunning is happening or overtraining or overloading is happening? Often you'll find that you're totally fatigued and all the time you are having fatigue, you know. Running as such is supposed to boost you like any other exercise. Exercise, you know, actually leads to release of what we call as endorphins. Endorphins are 
natural morphine like substances morphine you know is a stimulant makes you happy keeps your pain down and endorphins are those natural uh, hormones which are released inside the body hormone like sub, uh, uh, substances uh, chemicals which are released in the body when you do exercise that's what leads us to feel you know elevated and feel happy after doing a run or an exercise even though you are you have struggled in your run post exercise you feel good you know you feel fresh and you feel energetic and that is because of uh, endorphins but if you find that you are constantly getting fatigue you feel tired and you're worn out then pains you are may possibly doing overtraining you are doing possibly over overdoing that uh, activity or you are having frequent mood changes instead of feeling happy you are feeling irritable you are shouting you are screaming you are having a issue with your uh, colleagues at office or at at your spouse family uh, wife or husband or your children you know you are not in the right mood or you are paying or you are doing frequent visits to the doctor it may not be because of an injury but you are visiting the doctor frequently or you are not sleeping well see if you are exercising well you should be sleeping well if you are not sleeping well you are having trouble sleeping or you have this constant heaviness in the legs you feel tired and achy sensations in the legs all these could be indications that you may be doing overrunning so you have to exercise caution you if you are aware of these uh, uh, signs then you will you know notice those signs and take care so <coughs> sorry so you have these different types of common injuries that happen in the, uh, in the, in the in the runner especially these are the common injuries that happen uh, as you can see in the slide uh, iliotibial band syndrome runner's knee which is uh, pain in the front of the knee uh, associated with the kneecap the tendon associated with the kneecap the patella tendinitis itb is a pain along the uh, outside outer aspect of the thigh it can happen at the lower aspect of the thigh it can happen at the upper aspect of the thigh where you have a tight band i will explain a little bit as we go along plantar fasciitis is pain at the sole of the feet as you can see uh, uh, at the sole then you can have shin pain that is the bony part on the front of the leg you can have pains there aches there or you can have pain at the achilles because achilles tendon which is the tendon at the back of the heel the achilles tendon is one of the one of the strongest and largest tendons in the body and achilles tendon obviously is required to do all the running activity when you push the ground you are contracting the muscles associated with the achilles tendon that is the gastrocnemius and the soleus we call it gastrosoleus and that Uh, uses the tendon to uh, pull the he uh, pull the foot downwards and you propel or push the ground uh, when you are doing the running so these tendons and these uh, uh, fascias are, are prone to uh, injuries along with this i might add uh, hamstring strain and low back ache they are also commonly seen among uh, runners so i will go a little bit into each of these runner's knee like i said uh, runner's knee is in the front of the knee and basically the knee this is a the image to your left that is the image of the knee from the side so you have the thigh bone this is the thigh bone and this is the knee cap and this is the leg bone and the quadriceps is in the front of the thigh and the hamstrings are in the back of the thigh so basically the quadriceps is trying to pull the leg upward like that using the knee cap or the patella uh, the medical term for that is patella we commonly call it as knee cap so it's using the knee cap like a fulcrum so if you see the image on the right you know where the guy is using a long lever or a long uh, rod to lift that big piece of stone he is using this small amount of st um, uh, stone or small stone on the bottom which is the fulcrum so similarly in the knee the knee cap is the fulcrum so the fulcrum gets a lot of load so if you have an imbalance issue like your quadriceps usually the hamstrings will be very tight and the quadriceps will be weak this happens when you have knee pain because pain has got an inhibition inhibitory activity that means it will inhibit activity in that particular leg or arm without you noticing it sometimes subconscious if it's very painful obviously you're not going to be using that arm that's a protective mechanism of the body body doesn't want you to move something that is painful because it thinks there is problem there and so it will not allow you to move it so if you are having even mild pain there will be an inhibitory action so you, subconsciously you will not be using that knee well 
And all, very often we see that. And then we see that the quadriceps, which is the muscle on the front of the thigh, is all small and shrunken. And so that small shrunken quadriceps, but the powerful hamstrings at the back leads to an imbalance. And that imbalance leads to over overloading of the fulcrum, which is the kneecap. And that leads to pain. So that is one common cause of pain in runners, very often seen. The most common pain actually is this, what we commonly refer to as runner's knee. And that is number one cause for patients, you know, beginning runners who are just starting to be, uh, run to come uh, uh, visiting a doctor to see what's happening in the knee. Also, this is commonly seen in women. Women, it's a slightly different issue, is that the, they have wider hips because they have, they have, uh, they, uh, you know, they bear children, they have children, and so the pelvis is wider, and as a result, the hips are wider, while the knees are narrower. So they have this angle from the wide hips coming down to the narrow uh, knees. And so the structures on the outside of the thigh and the hip, they are all, if they are tight, they will keep pulling the kneecap towards the outside. That leads to a little, what we call as mal tilting of the patella or tilting of the kneecap and lead to abnormal forces in the kneecap, resulting in knee pain again. So these are some of the common causes for knee pain uh, leading to runner's knee, okay? The other common uh, cause of pain around the knee is what we call as the iliotibial band syndrome, or IT band syndrome. So iliotibial band, as you can see on that diagram on the bottom of your screen, this is again a side view of the leg. Uh, gluteus maximus is the butt muscle and that leads to a, that white color band that you're seeing is a white thick fascia or fascia is like a band or sheet of tissue. It's not muscular, but when the muscles uh, attach to some other muscle or when the muscle is going to attach to bone, they turn into thick fibrous structures called fascia or tendon or ligaments. Okay, So you have this tight thick fascia on the outside. In, even if you touch your thigh, you know, on the inside it will be soft and the outside will be a little firmer. This firm tissue is that IT band. So if the IT band is very tight, then it will rub against the bony structures around the knee, on the outer aspect of the knee, and cause inflammation and pain. So that's the IT band. Sometimes the IT band can also rub against the hip. Hip also you have a prominent bone on the outer aspect, and that band can rub over that prominent bone and cause inflammation and pain. So IT band, but the knee pain is more common. This is another cause for pain. So patients will usually present with vague pain around the outer aspect of the knee. Uh, um, and that's the common causes IT band, uh, tightness of the fascia. But the reason why I put up that uh, uh, photo of those runners on the top, <coughs> sorry, is to uh, tell you one common re other common reason, in addition to this IT band being tight, is that sometimes the gluteus medius, so the butt has got three muscles, maximus, medius, and minimus. Uh, so you have the maximus on the outside, then you have the medius and the minimus, which are smaller muscles, but they are there underneath that butt muscle. So if the medius, which is one of them, is also weak, then this will happen. If you see the runner uh, with the red t-shirt, you see how our knee is sort of crossing that red line. You know, the red line is the midline and the knee is starting to cross that when she's uh, 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 putting her, when she's on that one leg, you know, the knee is starting to cross like that across. It shouldn't cross like that. Uh, if you see the runner with the purple shirt, you see how her knee is, hips are broad, but her knees are not crossing the midline. So this kind of running usually seen in ladies is because of that gluteus medius being weak. So, so what I was trying to say is that usually uh, this imbalance problem is either because some structure is tight or some muscle is weak. That leads to that imbalance. So you know everything works in the body on the basis of balance. One muscle group does one activity and the other muscle group does the opposing activity. So in the knee, it's the hamstrings on one side and the quadriceps on the other side. And they both need to be in good function to be balancing the knee. So if the quadriceps becomes weak, then you'll overload the knee. Or the hamstrings becomes too tight, then it'll again overload the knee. So you need both stretching to stretch the tight tissue and you need strengthening to strengthen the weak muscle. 
so it's a it's both it's not just one so you need that's the reason why stretching and strengthening go together especially for the runner then the other more common like i was telling the earlier is the achilles tendonitis and the plantar fasciitis so the achilles tendon as you can see is that big thick white uh, band of tissue that runs from the muscle which is the red one and attaches to the bone the heel bone heel bone is the calcaneum that's the medical term we call it the heel bone so this achilles tendon again is a very thick tight tissue and that is prone for injury because it's taking a lot of load when you're doing this repetitive kind of injury so more common tears are of course very rare but more common to have sprains strains sprains strains are the way i explain it to patient is if you have normal tendon on one side and you know a torn tendon on the other side strain is something somewhere in between there is some injury to the uh, unit there may be some micro injury micro tears but grossly the structure is intact so that's what we call as a strain and that leads to pain and that's how uh, runners end up uh, seeing a doctor and asking them you know i have pain at the back of the heel so back of the heel is usually related to achilles tendon at the bottom of the heel or bottom of the foot you have another tight structure and that is called the plantar fascia so plantar fascia and achilles tendon these are the two areas which lead to pain in the back of the heel and the under surface of the heel so sometimes either there are micro injuries or what we call as strains as well leading to pain and uh, pain and uh, discomfort so one of the questions that uh, uh, one of the questions that i saw in the list of questions was how do i differentiate between pain and discomfort i mean any kind of activity you do obviously uh, you are going to face discomfort no pain no gain this is what i tell clearly if you are not having pain then you are not gaining you are not doing anything at all your status quo so you have to go through pain in order to get gain that's a common parlance you know but it's actually not gain, uh, pain it's actually discomfort so how do you differentiate you know after you have played a game of cricket suddenly one day you discover that your muscles are sore your hands are paining or your thighs are aching that soreness is what we call as discomfort so pain on the other hand is present both in rest and activity and it is usually sharp in nature it's stabbing type or pricking type it's sharp it's sudden it it brings uh, to your attention immediately you know you have to take note of it immediately that kind of pain that is that kind of uh, thing is not discomfort it's pain and it usually does not lessen with time yeah. on the other hand discomfort will slowly go away it start decreasing today if you are having discomfort tomorrow it will be lesser day after tomorrow it will be almost down to negligible that is discomfort pain is persistent it's sharp present in both rest and activity and it is usually deep you will be muscular and deep sometimes you will feel it inside the joints as well on the other hand discomfort like i said is usually absent at rest comes on activity dull in nature vague you're not able to locate it and it lessens usually as you give it a little bit of time so if you're having persistent discomfort if you feel it's discomfort but not going away in 2 3 days uh, better to visit either a physiotherapist or a trainer or a or a doctor in the hospital or clinic okay so that's how you identify the injury whether it's a pain or discomfort based on pain or discomfort and so like i said earlier it's all about balance uh, balance is very important in 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 any kind of activity that involves it. and including running it's also important in cycling swimming everything any kind of activity that the body is involved in balance is important so on on one hand you have tight structure and one hand you have a Uh, lax muscle this is usually the pattern and so you need to do stretching exercises to uh, stretch out the tight structure so that it it's not tight anymore and you need to do strengthening exercises to tone up the muscle and that's how you restore balance so restoring balance is the key to uh, uh, preventing and if you have got injured to go back to an injury free uh, running okay but i must emphasize i cannot Uh, leave this without emphasizing on rest and recovery rest and recovery is critical to any kind of uh, sport and especially in running uh, sometimes beginners make this mistake that i want to do running every day because there's a marathon coming up and i have to do my training i have to complete my period and that's 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 a certain way of getting injured because when you do a particular activity and you're running 
and you're trying to build your strength, your stamina, your ability to run, actually the muscles are breaking down. So when you do a run, for example, a five kilometer run, the muscle units will actually break down. They will break. So it's sort, sort of like an injury, but we don't call it as injury. And then when you give rest, that muscle unit will recover. That means the body will repair the muscle and make it stronger enough to do activity more than five kilometers. That's how you gradually build your muscle strength and uh, ability to take the load. Similarly, the tendons and the ligaments, they are not static structures. Though on the imaging, they look like they're the same shape and the same thing. They are actually changing. Uh, every time you do run, they are actually changing and they're adapting. So this muscle building activity or tendon or the ligament building activity happens during the rest time. That's why it's important to rest. When you rest, you allow the muscle to recover. You allow the tendon to recover. And it comes out stronger, much stronger than when you did your last run. And that's how slowly, gradually you build your strength. So resting is very, very important and critical. Ideally, you should do two to three days of rest, but you, know, you, can, you should not do running more than five days a week. That means mandatory to have at least two days of rest. That means three, three, three days running, maybe one day rest, another two days running, one day rest. That would be sort of the pattern I would look at. So it not only helps the muscles to uh, heal and rebuild, also you allow your mind and body also to recover. You know, running, like any other activity, is a stressful activity. It's a different thing that this kind of stress is enjoyable or uh, brings pleasure to you. But still, it's a stress on the mind. You know, getting up early in the morning, running. So giving the mind and the body time to recover and heal is very, very important. So you can, it doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, not doing any kind of activity. You can do some, con, some other kind of activity which will involve other muscle groups. That's why they say you should do CrossFit uh, training. That means you do activity which is different than your running. So you could do activities like walking, swimming, cycling, or even yoga. Uh, yoga is a good combination of both stretching and strengthening exercises. So rest and recovery is very, very important for you to get back to running and to continue running, okay? But the, <coughs> sorry, but the biggest thing that I, for me personally as a runner is uh, is the discipline it brings a lot of discipline in your life and that i think is important to achieve a lot of goals in your life that discipline without that you know achieving goals are very difficult and that's what has running taught me so so to summarize basically you uh, plan out your running you do safe running you do both stretching strengthening exercises uh, so that you don't have injuries. And if at all you have a particular injury and it is lasting beyond a two to three days time, then it's time for you to visit someone and let a expert, either a trainer, physical trainer or a physiotherapist. Even physiotherapists are well-trained and looking up injuries or a doctor in a hospital or clinic who can understand and help you with the injury. There was uh, one question about uric acid. Uric acid usually uh, is not injury related, but sometimes minor injuries, especially if you have had uric acid problems. Uric acid is basically a crystal, like salt. You know, like salt. Salt is like a powder. If you if you feel salt, you can feel it in your hand, like a powder. But the amazing the thing about salt is the once you put it in water and it dissolves. Even if you put your hand inside the water, you cannot feel the salt because it's in a dissolved state. So similarly, uric acid is actually a salt. It forms a salt uh, and it stays in a dissolved state. It is a byproduct of protein metabolism. When we break down protein, uric acid is produced. It's a byproduct. Just like you know, when you burn something, smoke comes out as a byproduct. So the metabolism in the body of breaking down of the protein leads to release of uric acid. And uric acid being a byproduct has to be thrown out of the body. And it circulates in blood, reaches the kidney, and then it's thrown out in urine. So that's how it goes. But sometimes uric acid can come out of blood. When, it, when does that happen? When uh, the levels of fluid in your body goes down. That means you're dehydrated or your protein intake is going up. A very common thing here because uh, a lot of people are protein, uh, very heavy on protein here. And the fact that it's very hot climate, people are usually dehydrated. Both hot, extreme heat and extreme cold, both are dehydrating. That means outside weather, which is extreme heat, is dehydrating. And sitting inside the AC, equally dehydrating. 
So both are dehydrating. And in such a situation, you tend to lose a lot of water, especially if you're not carrying a bottle of water. And then uric acid levels go up. Then they come out of blood and deposit in and around uh, joints. Uh, minor injuries can attract the uric acid and lead to uric acid crystal deposit, what we call as gout, actually. Um, but that's not directly injury related. But if you have been having uric acid related problems earlier, it's likely that minor injuries can cause. So one of the tricks to avoid that is to lower your protein intake and increase your hydration. Hydrating well is very critical as well in running. Uh, that's important uh, to avoid uric acid uh, related problems. Um, somebody also asked about salt and lemon. So, you know, when you run, you do a lot of sweating and obviously you lose a uh, lot of uh, these electrolytes. The salt is basically electrolytes, what we medically call as electrolytes, sodium, chloride. These are the electrolytes which are present uh, in the blood and they tend to escape with sweating. So you tend to lose that. So it's always a good idea to replenish that electrolytes. So if you're adding salt and lemon to your water that you're drinking while running, that's a very good idea. Uh, in fact, you know, there are commercial gels and all which have adequate, there are also salt tablets available you can use that, but uh, nothing like you have to use this or that. Whatever works for you is the best. Uh, but hydrating well, uh, replenishing your electrolytes is is important uh, part of the running uh, process. So somebody also asked about flat foot. Flat foot means um, if you look at the uh, arch uh, in the in this foot, you know our feet are not flat. That means the whole foot doesn't touch the ground. The ground, it will touch the ground here and at the heel region. And this portion, which is like an arch, you know. So if the arch is less, then we call it as a flat foot. So the arch, why is the foot arch like that? It's arch because it, it behaves like a spring. So when you do the running activity, it behaves like a spring. It absorbs and releases energy. And by that, it dissipates the energy. And, you know, uh, a fracture or breaking happens when energy is not being dissipated it's not going away you know when footballers fall they will roll on the ground they roll on the ground because they want to break the energy and they want the energy to dissipate the energy is converted to you know in physics we call it as kinetic energy mechanical energy gets converted to kinetic energy and when the energy gets dissipated then the bone is saved from breaking so that spring like action helps to dissipate the energy there's no force concentration so they uh, uh, prevents injury so if you're having a flat foot, uh, it's a good idea to wear shoes which have uh, arches inside them. Most sports shoes or running shoes nowadays have good arches because they want to support the arch well when you're impacting the ground. So if you, but I've seen a lot of runners, I've seen a lot of people who are running, they have flat feet, they have absolutely no issues running. And when you're a recreational runner, these are very small issues, uh, they are not, they're going, they are not going to cause problems to you. Have a good shoe with a good arch support and you should be able to go into running. Should not be a problem at all. Um, that sort of uh, brings it. Uh, and somebody asked, is rest mandatory? I think I answered that question. Somebody also asked about stretching, whether it is mandatory after a run. Uh, studies have shown that if you, you know, normally stretching is advised before and after a run. Uh, before run, if you do, you should do a little warm up and then do the stretching. After the run, you are usually sufficiently warmed up. Warmed up means blood blood is flowing through those muscles and tendons and ligaments. Muscles usually have very good blood supply, but the tendons, the tendons are those attachments of the muscle into the bone. Those areas don't have good blood supply because blood flowing into them will create interference in that structure. So they don't have good blood supply. So you need to do a little bit of warm up and stretching to allow the blood to flow into them. So stretching before run should be done always after a small warm up, and after run it can be done. As far as injury prevention is concerned, uh, stretching before warm up has no role in injury prevention. That's what studies show. But stretching after a run is uh, helpful in injury prevention. It's been noticed that those who do stretching uh, have lesser injuries compared to those who don't do stretching after a run. So doing stretching after a run is very, very important. And I think you should consider it mandatory if you want to avoid injury.
I think more or less those are the questions uh, that have, uh, and that brings uh, my talk to an end. Uh, thank you so much. Sir, can we have some questions so people can put yeah. it in the chat box? Yes, please. Yeah, I have put one of I'll, them in the chat box if you can see. Uh, chat box. Let me see where is the chat box. Down below there is one chat. If you click on it, it will come open up from your right side. Yeah. Mine seems to be on the top. Okay, no problem. Uh, Okay, what is strain injury and generally it appears while running ultras, uneven paths? Strain, yeah? Viju, that's your question? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, so strain, like I said, uh, strain is between injury and normal, okay? That's how, what we call a strain. Strain usually implies muscle problem. On the other hand, sprain, one is with a T and the other one is with a P. Sprain, we usually use to refer to ligaments and uh, tendons. Because they are structurally different, we use this different terminology. Strain in, implies muscles, sprain in, implies ligaments and tendons. But I'll combine both. Both are not really massive injuries. They are some injury to the unit, means the unit is grossly functional. It can, it can work still, but it induces pain, there is inflammation. The reason why you get it in ultras is because obviously, like you have written, it's uneven paths, it's up and down, hill, uh, uneven ground, and so they, it's possible. But usually, like I said, injury means there is some problem with either some unit is, say for example, you are having uh, ankle sprain. It means the ligament or some ligament, tendon, or unit around the ankle is either tight and the other one, the muscles is usually lax. It's an imbalance issue that's going on, plus overtraining or overloading that is result uh, that results in a strain. Ultras, obviously, you know your volume of intensity, your volume of training is much much higher than a marathon runner. So, so if you are planning to do an ultra, obviously you must space out your training over a long period of time. And you must not do continuous runs. That means you should not do, for example, a good way to train for an ultra is to do a back-to-back -back run on say like a Friday, Saturday, rather than doing a long run on all, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, do long runs. Instead of that, do your long run on the weekend and then do your short runs uh, over the weekdays. So that way you can avoid a uh, sprain. I have a few more questions. I'm just posting sure. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so Anand is asking whether barefoot running is good. So the issue about barefoot runner is related to that video. Let me see if I can get that video running. Uh, that would have been wonderful, actually. Let's see. So basically, what this video is trying to show uh, is that is the type of barefoot running, actually. You know, barefoot running means if you see uh, children or babies running, you know, they'll be running on their tiptoes. They don't run like normal runners. So naturally, naturally, actually, we uh, are born to run like that. We, are, we run actually like that. But because we start running with shoes, we end up with heel strike. See, maybe now you can see the uh, running, uh, running video. Yeah, the black one we can see moving. Yes, yes. So if you see now... I will yes, stop that. Heel, heel is hitting. Heel is hitting first. Yes, see. So let me. Yes, so now you can see. So the heel, when it hits, uh, so barefoot running, basically, when you do barefoot running, you will not hit the heel on the ground because you don't have any protection on the heel. So naturally, a person will start running with a forefoot or a midfoot strike. That's the basic concept of barefoot running. That's, that's the benefit of barefoot running, basically. But obviously, you know, we are not used to walking, moving, running barefoot. So barefoot running, if you are, want to do barefoot running, obviously it's beneficial in that aspect. But you have to be careful, especially if you're doing road running, you're prone for injuries like blisters and more impact because there's nothing to absorb the impact of your foot on the, uh, on the ground. So it requires training, it requires discipline. Uh, 
and obviously the, the benefit uh, follows thereby. But I, I am not saying you should do barefoot running. You can do the same barefoot type of running if you concentrate on landing on your forefoot and midfoot. If you do that, that is the same as barefoot running. There's basically no difference in terms of impact and things like that. Okay. Uh, some, <laughs> Anand says we need to control the passion, getting over enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you answered my question. Okay. All right. So then uh, you're asking, Viju has posted, is running on road, does it have any impact on our body? How about interlocks? Uh, running on the road, uh, like I said, yeah, has more impact obviously than running on trails. Uh, but, you know, running, if as long as you follow the proper technique, that is you land on your forefoot, midfoot, you will be not causing, you know, the other way of finding out how, whether you're running the proper way um, is if you hear the person making noise when he's running, you know, the heel will hit the ground again and again, again and again. So you have this repetitive but 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 like that kind of sound coming that means you know the person is actually striking the ground with his heel if you see a, a proper runner you will you will they will, they call it soundless or uh, you will not hear that sound because they are running and the heel just touches and springs from the ground it doesn't slap the ground that's the other way of making out and so if you have that kind of running technique whether you run on a road whether you run on concrete whether you run on grass or whether you run on a train, the impact on the knee and the ankle and the hip will be the same. It will not make much of a difference. But obviously road running causes more impact uh, compared to trail runs or running on soft surfaces. Is everyday cycling good? Long distance cycling, will it have any issues in the body or waist? Yeah, cycling obviously is a different kind of exercise from uh, running and naturally you cover more distance on uh, cycling. Cycling involves different uh, groups of muscles altogether. Um, is everyday cycling good? Just like everyday running is not good, everyday cycling is also not good. Best is to space, out, space it out. Best is to do the way most runners do. Uh, do cycling on few days and do running on other days. So that way you have different muscle groups being active. So if you are doing running on one day and cycling the next day, the day you do cycling, the muscles involved in running get rest. And on the day you do running, the muscles involved in cycling get rest uh, and time to recover. So cycling every day, not good. Long distance cycling, will it have any issues on the body or waist? No, they don't because you know you, if you do anything, you have to do it gradually. If you do anything suddenly, then that's when it leads to injuries. So if you do gradually increase your activity level, slowly, 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 your body adapts to it, and then you're able to do better. Uh, people who have back pain usually have a problem with cycling because you have to lean forward. So having good core body is important, both in cycling and running, but more so in cycling. Can we have CrossFit running, uh, training and running on the same day, like morning and evening? Yeah, for a beginner, I think that's not a good thing to do. For a beginner, I think uh, the training load itself has to be less. So uh, good idea to do the CrossFit on uh, the rest days and do the running on the other days for a beginner. But as you get more and more experienced, the, as your activity and training load slowly increases, then you can start doing those things. Even, you know, there are, uh, even for, for example, you want to prepare for an ultra trail or a ultra marathon, then you may do a run in the morning and a run in the evening as well. People do that as well. That's also allowed. Uh, but you have to have a certain amount of training completed. I would say you should be doing at least a minimum of one year of running before you start experimenting with things like running in the morning, uh, running in the evening, running on two days consecutively, long runs. The same way, CrossFit running the CrossFit training in the morning and then running in the evening. These kind of things you should start doing once you are into running for some time. That sometime is usually, I would say, one year or at least you've done some kind of long distance running uh, on, a, uh, on a participatory level. Uh, 
Uh, does that answer the question? I think so. Okay, Krishna is asking, is it okay to have short pace runs once or twice a week and have an easy long run on weekend once? Is it okay to walk the day after tempo run? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your uh, running pattern is short pace runs and then once or twice a week and then have a long run on the week. Perfect, perfect. That's the way to do it. You're on the right track. Is it okay to walk the day after a tempo run? Perfect again, because walking again involves different group of muscles. So running and then walking the next day is the perfect way to do it. Stick to it, Krishna. Dr. RK has put one question. What is the difference on training on core and training on legs? Ah, so, <laughs> all right. So the core part of the body is the part of the body between the waist and the neck. So normally, uh, runners usually are very familiar with this, but normally people who do exercise or start to do exercise when they go to the gym first, and they usually do either cardiac exercise like walking, running, or they start with weight training. So they usually start lifting weights with the legs or the hands. But most people, beginners I'm saying, most people usually forget to train the part of the body between the neck and the waist. This part of the body is called the core body. So core training involves the core body. So any part of training, any stretching, strengthening exercises that you do for this part of the body is called core training. And having a core is one of the essential requirements of good running, especially long distance running. Because in long distance running, your muscles get fatigued. And if your core gets fatigued, you will start slumping. And that will put uh, your running into wrong form running, more overloading, make you injury prone, or make you have an injury, or make you get fatigued very easily. So having good core training is important. And uh, for a beginner, I think it's good to do core training on, 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 on alternate days or on your rest days. And as you get more and more experience, then you start doing more frequently, then you can do it in the morning and do it in the, do a run in the evening, that sort of thing. Okay, Selva Kumar is asking, what was your strategy and how did you accomplish your full marathon this year? <laughs> Follow the guru. <laughs> That's another part, important part of training. Uh, you should, you know, you should have a guru. You should have a role model. No matter how big you are, you should have always a role model. We call it a role model in the Western world. And in our part of the world, we call it guru. So having someone whom you can look up, look up to, somebody who's trained better than you, somebody who uh, has been training for a long time, can be a guru or a trainer uh, who can give you advice. And so, uh, having a guru is important because sometimes you get these uh, uh, doubts or uh, mental blocks and you can overcome those when you talk to those uh, talk to your guru because he'll help you clarify Papa, and give you a mental stop telling, uh, uh, uh. Okay. Just okay. Tell. Uh. sorry that's my son uh, he's advising me on how to speak okay so the strategy was to was to train, train enough. And because often, uh, even studies have reported this, that there is always a peak of injuries just before you have a marathon. For example, uh, I was reading on this uh, Vienna marathon, or you know, Austria, Vienna, that marathon is a very popular one. And uh, the researchers looked into running injuries among those people who are participating in the marathon. And they found, that the peak in the injuries was happening in the month of March because the marathon happens in April. And why does it happen in March? Because everybody is trying to uh, quickly, they would have signed up and they want to train or they wouldn't have trained over a period of months, but immediately previous to that month. That's when injury happens because they start running quick, uh, long runs. They start uh, running frequently. So the volume intensity running is not spread over a few months. So ideally, if you're preparing for a marathon, you should be training over at least two to three months prior to the marathon. That's what I did this year. I started training quite long, uh, earlier enough, and I tried to keep up with the group. If so, if you are with a group, you know, the group motivates you. That's the wonderful thing about 
running in with a group and running alone or single. Sometimes, of course, because of work or not finding time, you may not uh, be able to join the group. It's okay to do single runs, but otherwise, more or less, you should find the ideal group and join the group or join with someone, someone else who is close by to you. That's what I did this time. I stuck, stuck to the group. I stuck to my schedule. I ran the uh, training. I ran all the training runs, most, not all. Obviously, some, sometimes I was not able to complete. And that's the reason why I completed my run. I had a guru. I took, took my schedule. I spread my training over a couple of uh, three months, to be exact. And that's why I was able to complete the marathon this time. And that's exactly the same reason why I was not able to complete the marathon the last time, because I did not have all these things. So if you have all these things in order, you're certainly uh, certain to uh, complete the marathon. Thank you so much, doctor. That was very insightful. If anybody has any more questions, you can raise your hand or you can type it here. Thank you so much. Doctor, can we close that presentation so that we can see the faces yeah. of the participants? We are not seeing It's okay. How do I close? <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Uh, stop sharing. Ilya Raja, can you do that or uh, he will have to do it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Doctor, thank you so much. This is one of the best presentations we had during this lockdown period. Very insightful because it is it is closer to our heart. The main thing is that most of the runners have undergone one of these injuries. So they can relate to that. Okay, I have, when you were speaking about that, I had undergone this uh, uh, tendon, this many a things. Plantar fasciitis, all those months together. So when you were speaking about that, it, it could relate. Thank you so much. Very informative. I mean, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I also went through that phase. As a beginner, we all go through those phases. It's, it's not unusual. Just because I'm a doctor doesn't mean I don't have those issues. I had those issues as well. And that made me look into those issues more closely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kay, for giving this and opportunity. Very nice to be here. Your presentation, that presentation was amazing. It was beautiful. Very, very well prepared and very, uh, very beautifully uh, presented it. Uh, you, if anybody you. has any question, I think you can raise your hand, then Elaraja will unmute you. You know, one thing is that uh, whenever we are going through the injuries, you know, list yeah. he has mentioned, we are, going, we are gone through all these injuries, so we know what we have gone yeah. through that. It was very good. Thanks, sir. Yeah. And one of the all other these things that we have gone three, through. Uh, Anand, Vijay, and uh, me, we had uh, <laughs> run the Vienna. <laughs> so when we were we mentioning that, that. <laughs> yeah, we, we were good. <laughs> Ah, yes, I remember that. When I was going through the article, I was remembering uh, the three mosquitoes were there. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anybody has anything, you can raise your hand and uh, Leraja will unmute you or you can unmute yourself and ask doctor. Okay, do so fantastic.